I'll begin by apologizing for the sinus issues. I was born with them. I can't get rid of them. They are what they are. Uh, but it seems like for the last several weeks, all I've had is a drippy nose, so I apologize. Um, it is good to see all of you today. And um, I just, the message of that, each of those songs, but especially the last one for me, especially as we began to look at chapters 26, 27, 28 um, of Job, it just really speaks to the message, I believe. And hopefully that's what comes through today as I uh, share from my study of, of Job and as God leads us. Would you join me now for a word of prayer? Abba Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. Father, we thank you that you are God and that you love us immeasurably. We thank you for the many blessings that you pour down upon us. And Father, although it's hard, we thank you for the struggles. Because it's in the struggles that we can find you. It's in the struggles that we can gain wisdom from you and to grow in our faith. Because Father, it's in the struggles that we recognize that you are faithful, that you are strong, that you are wise, the only wise God. So, Father, today we come and we lift you up and we honor you. Thank you so much for Jesus, the greatest blessing that you have ever given, the gift of your Son. Father, thank you that, that he was willing to set everything aside for a time to come to this earth as a, as a little child, to allow us to see him, to know him, to watch him, to grow with him. Father, forgive us in where we have looked to other sources for our knowledge and for our strength. But we thank you that he loved us anyway. And he continues to love us. The evidences, his willingness to go to the cross, to bleed and to die, that we might have life. And life not just for a moment, but for all eternity. Father, we continue to lift up those of our number who aren't with us because of various health concerns. Father, some recovering from surgery at home, others uh, recovering in, and in rehab facilities, and Father, others still in the hospital. We just ask, Father, that in each of those cases that you would touch them and bring healing to them as only you can. We thank you for the doctors and the nurses and the specialists and all that are part of caring and treating them. But it's you that brings restoration. So, Father, we ask that you would bring healing. Father, we know there are others that are missing from our number for, for so many different reasons. You're aware of each one, Father. Some are emotional, some are spiritual, some are relationships, some are work, some are... The list just goes on and on. But, Father, would you infuse each situation with your love, with your compassion, with your grace, with your mercy, and most importantly, with your presence, that healing might come. And Father, for each of us that come today, we too have our own struggles, our own ups and downs, and Father, we're just so pleased to be able to be together as family to be in your presence and to come to hear what you have to, to share with us this day. So, Father, would you allow us to lay our burdens down? And, Father, give us the strength not to pick them back up, but to leave them with you and in your care. Just now, Father, calm our hearts, steal our minds, 
Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear all that you have for us this day. Set me aside, Father, and you come. Use my voice and you speak your wisdom and your truth. And so we invite you now, Father, please come and share with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bruce, I'll do my best not to knock that windsock off, but I make no promises. Neil was a kind and lovable character about the town. He was considered by many as, as one who was simple-minded, didn't fully comprehend things. And if you've ever known individuals, some can be cruel and they can use that or try and make uh, them feel less important. And certainly that was the case in Neil's life. Time after time, people in that small village would come up to him and they'd offer him a choice. They'd say, Neil, would you like a dime or a nickel? And Neil would always look at them and say, I'll take the nickel. Finally, a, a bystander who, who couldn't take it anymore and, and understood that the crowd was just poking fun at him began to approach Neil and, and he said, don't let those people fool you any longer. The nickel may be larger in size, but, but the dime is worth twice as much money. Neil looked at the, the bystander and kind of a sheepish grin on his face and said, I know that. But if I start taking the dimes, they'll stop offering the money. <laughs> Neil may have been simple-minded in a lot of ways, and especially in the eyes of the people, but he was wise in the ways of, of the world and people's characters. Wisdom and knowledge are a recurring theme throughout God's Word. Proverbs is, is all about wisdom. Yet, wisdom and knowledge, while they're related, are certainly not synonymous. They are not the same things. Wisdom has the ability to, to discern or judge what is true, what, what is right, what is lasting, while knowledge, on the other hand, is, is simple information gained through experience, reasoning, or, or acquaintance with something. And it's possible for us to have all manner of knowledge and lack wisdom. Don't miss that. It's possible to be the smartest man in the world and not have an ounce of discernment and common sense. And, and I can attest to that. In, in my former life as a department head for Kirby Risk and the corporate offices in West Lafayette, oftentimes I would bring in, and I'm not disparaging anybody. This is true, this is true of some Johnson students, okay? So it's not that I'm picking on Purdue students. Purdue is just the university that happens to be in West Lafayette, Indiana. And so I would bring in some temporary students, and, and they were very wise, and they were about ready to graduate and earn their degree, and, and you would expect them to, to have some, some knowledge about things, and they certainly did. But so often, they had no common sense. None. They were book smart, but life, excuse me for saying this, life dumb. They weren't prepared for life. I could bring them in and I could give them a, an assignment. If, if it was textbook, I guarantee you they would knock that, that job out of the park. But if there was one thing that was, was a little bit different than what the textbook said, they couldn't process it. They, they couldn't sit back and, and think through it and, and use some common sense and judgment to, to be able to solve the situation. 
The world's a lot like that. The church, unfortunately, at times, with certain people that are in it, are like that. It's significant that in Scripture, wisdom is not associated with, with knowledge. It, it truly isn't. It's often associated with the path that you are on, the, the direction that you are going. Are you going in the right direction? Are you on the right path, the one that leads to Christ and to salvation? Or are you veering off the path? Are you, are you chasing the things of the world? Do you know where, where you are on your map of life? Oh, and by the way, for the follower of Jesus, follower of Jesus Christ, easy for you to say, this is our road map. This is our guide. What's your compass? What's it pointing to? At the end of the day, wisdom is less about information than it is about orientation, being directly and laser focused on your point of direction. All the geographic data points in the world are useless to us in finding where we are unless we can determine true north. Take a compass. It's always going to point north. And that's how you begin to gain your, your direction and begin to be oriented. A.W. Tozer put it this way. As the sailor locates his position on the sea by shooting the sun... So we may get our moral bearings by looking to God. We must begin with God. We are right when and only when we stand in a right position relative to God himself. And we are wrong so, so far and so long as we stand in any other position. If, if our focus is on anything else, material things, money, jobs, relationships, other than a relationship with Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ, we're going to be on a path that leads to destruction. It's not me saying it. That's God saying it. Job's three friends have spent a great deal of time over several weeks, maybe even a few months, trying to get Job to let go of his, his point of focus. Remember, he recognizes that everything that is happening to him is from God. God is allowing all of this to happen. He's never questioned that. His only question is, why, God? What, why are you allowing this in my life? He never questioned where it came from. His focus was still on God. He would continue to, to serve him, and yet his, his friends are saying, no, no, you're, you're wrong. You, you've got something in your life, some sin that you haven't confessed, that you're hiding from, from trying to hide from God. You're, you're hiding from the world and, and maybe even trying to hide it from yourself. Like the like Job's friends, the, the world would have us believe that a good life, true happiness, and, and joy are, are found in the things that we have, the, the created things, rather than the Creator Himself. We think the solutions of the world too often are in men. And if you doubt that, go listen to anybody talk about current political situations. And I don't care which side you're on. This guy has got the answer. This guy doesn't. This guy's got the answer, and your guy is full of hot air. And I'm going to trust him because he's going to get us out of this. 
Folks, our faith has to be in God and God alone. I believe that, that Job knew that. And as he hears Bildad, Bildad give him his last words, and, and really, they're very short. Chapter 25 is the shortest chapter, I believe, in, in Job. And those are Bildad's, Bildad's final words to Job. And in Job 26, Job says to him these words, reading from the New uh, Living Translation, verses 2 through 4. How you have helped the powerless. There's sarcasm in there. You need to hear this sarcasm from from Job as he's talking to his friends. He's addressing Bildad, but, but he's speaking to the other two as well. How you have helped the powerless. How you have saved the weak. How you have enlightened this, my stupidity. What wise advice you have offered. Where have you gotten all these sayings? Whose spirit speaks through you? Basically what Job is saying, everything you've told me I know is, is worthless. And where are you getting it from? Who is, who's your source? Because it certainly isn't my source. Because my source is Yahweh. And the Yahweh I know is not the one you are describing. Job tells them their words have have served as little help to him. They've offered no encouragement, no comfort, no hope. Remember, their their whole guise in coming was, was to comfort their friend. And instead, they have turned into people that have taken shot after shot at Job thinking they were trying to help him. I I believe their motives were probably pure. The only way we can help you, Job, is if you admit you're wrong. I think their motives were pure. But they were certainly misguided because they were allowing themselves to speak from the ways of the world and not truly knowing God. They they knew about God. They had a whole head knowledge of of who God was. But it never met reality to them. They only served to tear down their friend instead of building him up. It wasn't enough that he suffered the excruciating loss of of everything. It wasn't enough that he was going through this physical turmoil of, of boils all over his skin that he was having to scrape and hope would heal. The words, too, would serve as a knife cutting into his very soul. And Job is troubled. Too often, well-meaning individuals, followers of Christ, do the same thing in the world today. I've witnessed it. I have a son who doesn't go to church. All because of what believers at a church did in the way that they treated him. It doesn't matter what dad says. That's just dad. Oh, and dad's a preacher, so he's supposed to say these things, right? Now, I can talk with Joshua, and he can, he can share his faith in God. He prays, but he's separated from the church. It's not a good place to be, and he's there because well-intentioned people didn't live out Christ in their life when he was a young teenager. When a person who is struggling with their their current situations, they very well may have been, and, and situations they very well have may have been responsible for on their own. It was it was their choices, it was their decisions. They may be there because of of things they did. They may be there because of somebody else's. Or they may be there to be tested, which is certainly where Job was. 
In those moments, folks, the last thing they need from, from people who know Jesus is for us to pile on. They don't need us to, to point out their, their faults. They're hurting. They, they know that. They're, they're looking for a hand up. They're looking for someone to come alongside them and and to show compassion on them exactly the way Jesus Christ has showed compassion on each one of us. Paul says, we're no different than these people. We were once them. But by the grace of Jesus Christ, we're not there anymore. And then Jesus says to his disciples and to us, I've set for you an example. You go and and do likewise. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the believers in Thessalonica, admonishes them that they are to be encouragers, to encourage one another and to build one another up. We we don't do that by judging their current situations. I remember the jail ministry I was involved in down in in Richland. As I would go in with with other ministers on a Friday night and we would take turns sharing a message with the inmates. The last thing the inmates needed me to do was say, here's why you're here. I think they knew why they were there. I don't don't think that was an issue. I don't think they needed me to tell them that. What they needed was a message of love and grace and compassion and to point them to the one who is wise, who can make all the difference in their world and in their life. I can help guide them there. But it takes Jesus in their life and them opening up to them and and them gaining that knowledge and that experience. See, instead... We need to be diligent in taking to heart Paul's words, even those that, that he spoke uh, to, the, to the believers in Galatians, in Galatia, in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. He says, dear brother, again, New Living Translation, dear brothers and sisters, if any believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly, you who are focused and oriented towards God, who who are serving him and being faithful, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Now, let me ask you, do you think Job's friends were being gentle and humble? Because I don't. They were pretty harsh at times. He continues, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, Obey the law of Christ. Help carry that burden. Help walk with them. Job's friend didn't know this kind of wisdom. Their wisdom was based on the mere knowledge of what they could see, smell, and touch in their lives. And wisdom is far more than simply that empirical knowledge, those things that we can get through our senses. Oswald Chambers said it this way, never try to explain God until you have obeyed God. Never try to explain God until you have obeyed God. The only bit of God we understand, truly understand and gain wisdom from is in the areas that we have obeyed God. And he blesses us for that. Job, it seems to me, believes godly wisdom is of greater value than just that simple, basic knowledge of God, that that head knowledge. For for Job, it, it was his life. He lived God daily, and he continued, even in the midst of of this not knowing and in the midst of his struggle, he still trusted God, as we've seen in, in past chapters that we have looked at, even to the point where Job would say, even though he slays me, even though he kills me, even though he does away with me, yet will I trust 
him. Job 28, 12 says, says this, looking and trying to understand, but, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Job is looking at his friends and saying, your wisdom is coming from a place that's, that's empty. It, it's void. There, there's a little bit of knowledge, but there's not much else. Where is true wisdom to be found? And where is the place of understanding? And then he tells us a couple places he's sure that wisdom is not, not found. And probably where his friends were, were looking for it at. In Job 28, 13 and 14. Man does not know its worth. And it's not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me. And the sea says, it's not with us. You see, it's not in the things God created. Wisdom is not there. The wisdom of the Creator is in the Creator God. Searching for it anywhere else is fruitless, empty, and void. He also says wisdom is not something that that money and material things can buy. You can't go out and and buy wisdom. Oh, we can go to college and we can pay for our degrees and we can gain a lot of knowledge. But knowledge isn't wisdom. Listen to Job in, in Job 28, 15 through 19. It cannot be bought for gold and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir In precious onyx or sapphire, gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. The wisdom that we get from God, that is found in God, is priceless. He gives it freely. If you ask, the half-brother of Jesus, James, tells us that. If you lack wisdom, ask for it. And he will give freely. But its value is is priceless. You can't put a price tag on wisdom, and it's that wisdom that will see us through the struggles of this world, the struggles that come in our lives, because we are anchored in the one who is wise. Job then closes all of those thoughts before he will begin to give a final defense before God. And he offers the answer to his question. And remember his question. Where is true wisdom to be found? Where is understanding? Where's the place of understanding? In Job 28, 28, he tells us. He spells it out for us. And he said to to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord... That is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. You see, true wisdom's not found in in any earthly thing. Rather, it's found in a, a true reverence and an awe of God, a willingness to surrender our entire life over to Him, to be obedient in keeping his commands, in in living out his truths and speaking his truth in love, compassion, grace, and mercy. Because the devil's alive and well, and he's got plenty of people out there preaching those lies. We need to speak truth to them, but we have to do it in a way that is couched in our fear of God and in love and grace 
and mercy. We do it as we look and see God for who he is. And we see God by looking to Jesus. Remember last week we talked about the the cloud of witnesses and looking to Jesus. We look to Jesus because it is in him that the Father has been revealed to us. Jesus himself says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. There is no difference. If you've witnessed Jesus, then you have witnessed the Father. One individual has described the the fear of the Lord this way. I really really like this picture. I don't know why, but I did. He says it's like a, a teenage driver who suddenly spots her father's car in her rear view mirror. I've been there, by the way. (laughs) Seeing him back there puts her on notice to be on her best behavior. When we are constantly looking to Jesus, we desire to be on our best behavior, to be followers of Jesus Christ, to live out his commandments, to be obedient. And so she does Determined to be on her best behavior, to use her blinkers, and to stop at yellow lights rather than trying to run through it before it turns red. To keep both hands on the wheel. But it tells her something else, something more. It tells her this. Her father cares enough about her to follow her to keep an eye on her, to encourage her, to build her up. It tells her that she is safe. Her father isn't trying to trap her or trick her. He's not sitting back waiting for her to to mess up just so he can pounce on her and pile on. No, he loves her. He wants the best for her. He's trying to help her to develop good habits and and not just to be careful on this one trip, but to obey the laws and stay safe until she gets home. Life is a trip. Life is a journey. Home is heaven. God watches us, not to pounce on us, but to care for us and to share his love and his wisdom. For the people of God, the the fear of the Lord means we live life with our Heavenly Father always in our rearview mirror, always watching, always caring, always protecting. We glance up and we see his brilliant holiness, but, but also his care and his love. Our response, the fear of the Lord is a mix of reverence, a true fear. I feared my father, I did. But I knew also that he loved me and I could trust him. And our Heavenly Father is no different. In in fact, our Father, our earthly fathers at times will let us down. They will disappoint us just as we will them. But God never will. He won't. It's not in his character. It's not who he is. Job would say this. Because of his fear of the Lord. Listen to these words of of true wisdom, I believe. In Job 27, 2 through 6. As God lives, who who has taken away my, my right, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, The Spirit of God is in my nostrils. As long as God continues to breathe into me and give me life, my lips will not speak falsehood. 
and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right, speaking to his friends. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. I will remain committed to my God. And he will be there in the end. I don't know when the end will be, Job says. Job doesn't know. He, in fact, he's been praying that God would just end his life. But I want you to also remember the words of Job that we saw in his response last week in Job 23, 10 through 12. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I come out as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I've kept his ways, and I've not turned aside. I've not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. I've anchored my soul in him. And though I'm going through this struggle, and though my spirit is deeply troubled, It is godly wisdom that will see me through it. And I can only get that from him. Wesley So, the the current U.S. chess champion, shares how he came to know Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. He says, on the small planet where elite chess players dwell, every people, very few people worship Jesus. If anyone discovers that you are one of those, you know, superstitious, narrow-minded idiots, his words, not mine, you're likely to see nasty comments accumulate on your Facebook page. They wonder how I, the the world's second-rate chess player, can be so simple-minded. Wesley grew up in the Philippines, and he was a child, as a child was told that if he was good, God would bless him. But this confused him, because it seemed like the bad people received more than the good people, exactly what Job was struggling with. He knew of many famous crooks who went to church, and, and they were pretty rich. So, so Wesley decided to play it safe. He would, he would recite the right words. He'd, he'd gain a little bit of knowledge. He would recite the right words, but he never connected to God in a meaningful way. He played chess since age six or seven, and as he grew up, he, he kept on winning but he could never afford to hire a coach or get serious about his training. When he was 18, he got an offer to play on the chess team of a small American university. And so he left home and he moved to America. He said, I then met the people who would become my foster family. They were Christians, followers of Jesus. And Lotus, my my foster mother, could sense my unhappiness. She asked me what I wanted to do in life. And I replied that I loved playing chess, but I didn't think I was talented enough to to translate that into a full-time career. Lotus told me to focus on chess alone for the next two years. The family would support me any way they could. His foster parents, as, we, as I said, were, were Christians. They were ma- mature Christians. And they insisted that, it, as a living, uh, that living as a member of the family meant that he would need to be uh, faithfully accompanying them to church on a weekly basis. His family loved him. They taught him the Bible was the real authority, the truth of God's word, who he is, the direction that he gives us. Deeper and wiser than internet and and more truthful than any of his earthly friends. 
He says, before long, I was practicing my faith in a more intense way. My new family calls Christianity the thinking man's religion. They encourage me to ask questions, search for answers, and to really wrestle with what I discovered. I knew I wanted the kind of simple, contented, God-fearing life they enjoyed. I wanted God's wisdom in my life, is what he says. People in the chess world sometimes want to know whether I think God makes me win matches. I answer them yes. But then I say this, and sometimes he makes me lose them too. He is the God of chess and more Importantly, the God of everything. Win or lose, I give him the glory. Will I rise to become the world champion one day? Only God knows for sure. In the meantime, I know that he is a generous and loving father. Always shower me with more blessings than I could possibly deserve. Words that call us to be anchored in the wisdom, the godly wisdom of of our Father God. And the only way we can do that is surrendering our lives to His Son fully and completely. Allow me to, to leave you today with the words of wise King Solomon as he writes in Proverbs. Chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Keep godly wisdom and common sense. And they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely. And your foot will not stumble. In all this, we're told, Job did not sin in what he said. He trusted in the wisdom of God. And in that, he could know his life was secure. And his foot did not stumble. That same life is available to us. It's available to you today if you don't have it. But it takes a commitment of surrendering the things of the world and accepting Jesus not just as Savior, but as Lord. And the choice, as always, is ours. What will you choose? Let's pray. Abba, Father, for these words we give you thanks. Father, may we be people that are constantly seeking you. People of your word, people that commit our lives to understanding all that you have for us, understanding that your word is a guide to us. It is a map, and it is Jesus that is our compass, our true north, our anchor, our shelter in times of storms. But Father, we need to willingly surrender our lives to his lordship to release control of our lives from ourselves and give it all to him. So Father, if there's one here today that is hanging on to to control, and Father, some may be those that know your son. They've made that initial commitment of faith and yet there's things they're 
they're refusing to let go of. Father, search our hearts and show show us those. For those that have never made that commitment of faith, Father, allow your spirit to begin to move in their lives. And we'll be careful in all things to give you the glory. For you alone are worthy. And then, Father, take us and use us this week as we go about life and we be a shining light in a dark world. We ask all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Once again, we come to that time of, of response. The Lord has come. The Lord has shared from his word. And he has spoken to each of us in some way. And now he bids you come. Maybe that's for your initial commitment of faith. Maybe that's a, a, confession, a time of confession saying, I've not been everything I'm supposed to be yet, but I want to be. Maybe it's just that you need someone to pray with. Whatever it is, I encourage you, please don't leave without responding. And you can come forward. I'll be here to greet you and to talk with you. For those of you watching us online, he invites you as well. We encourage you that if he's spoken to your heart, give us a call here at the church this week. We'd love to get to know you and to to share with you and to share the love of Christ and what his word teaches. So I invite you now, would you respond as we stand and as we sing?